Welcome to Book Club. Our guest, Akshat Bratty, um, is actually doing a double act. He's also at Hay Festival. So we're really lucky that um, we're getting him at the same time as Hay. Um, Hi, Nasir. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Hi, no, my friend. It's difficult oh. to contact uh, you more, more difficult. Um, somebody is off mute. But um, you India number you use everywhere. Therefore, I, I maybe always before use we do the um the formal introduction. Um, so I'll... no, uh, so when are you back in India? We have not met and spoken for. I will a hand over to EJ um to just give a few housekeeping rules of thumb. Hi guys, and um, welcome to this month's book club. We're delighted that you're able to join us um for this session and hear your thoughts. Um, before we get into the session, a couple of housekeeping um, bits. If you could please stay on mute and ask us otherwise, that would be great. Um, the session is being recorded and in spirit of having the book club feel like an in-person session, um, it would be great if you could keep your cameras on. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but I'll now hand over to Louise to begin the session. Thank you. And as said, um, I am absolutely thrilled to uh, welcome Akshat Rati to our wonderful book club. I hope you'll be, um, that you, you've either enjoyed the book already or that you'll be running out and buying it after today. Um, as I said, Akshat is sharing, we're sharing him with Hay Festival, um, which uh, I think is kudos to all of us, but also to him for doing um, both at the same time, based in in a small trailer or shed or something um, in, in the British countryside. Uh, as some of you will know, Akshat is a London-based science journalist, really, working for Bloomberg News, um, has also worked for Quartz and The Conversation, and has won many, many awards for his journalism over the years in what I would term as investigative science journalism. Is that fair? Um, I, I feel like that's it. And um, his book, and um, some of you have seen it, Climate Capitalism. Yeah, this is my notes. Actually, I'd be warned. I have lots of things to ask you. Um, has been named one of the best books of the year by the Economic Times and the Times and has gathered praise from basically all quarters I could find. And it's come um, on a recommendation from one of our regular book club members, Thomas Lingard, and um, I'm not sure whether Thomas is, is joining us today, but he's also quoted in the book somewhere. So I'm not, um, if you as a book club member have um, a book you think we should look at, please, please send it to me or the team at any point and um, and we'll, con we'll consider it. Um, we, there's lots of books to, to get through, of course, but this one felt really, really important to the work that we do, the work that most of you um, do or other people aim to do. So welcome, Akshat. Let's just start there and take a breath. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's uh, I am in a barn, luckily not a shed, okay. but uh, it will be a test of British infrastructure. Uh, and uh, I suppose that is the topic of the conversation. Can we build the solutions we need for the planet? Uh, internet is one of them for sure. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'm sure we, yeah, fingers crossed and otherwise, you know, we'll switch off cameras or um, if we need to, but hopefully it will, it will all hold. And before we dive into the book, and again, there's, as, as you can see, so many little notes I made of what about this and have you thought of that and explain a bit more. I just wanted to start with you. Um, how you uh, came to be a journalist based in the UK. I know you're, you're born in India and degree from India. So how did you come to to, to be here in, in, in the, here I say, I'm, I'm, I'm in Oslo at the moment, but in the UK and, and, and write. And then from science, you moved to, to climate specifically. And I'd just love to, to, to hear about your story really. Yeah, um, it, it yeah, it's not the obvious story, but uh, it starts obviously, which is that I uh, after uh, becoming an engineer in India, which is typically what you do if you're any good at science or math, uh, become an engineer or a doctor. Um, I decided I wanted to do research. Uh, there were a number of people from my university going out and doing research, and I found that very exciting. 
Um, and so I was fortunate to get into Oxford. I studied for a PhD in chemistry. But while doing research, I sort of two things happened. One, the life of a professor didn't feel very appealing. And two, um, I came from a very hyper specialized education uh, in undergrad because I was at a chemical engineering institute. From that, going to Oxford sort of was a world expanding uh, experience and I wanted more of it. And to me, writing was a hobby that I, I uh, picked up um, from school, but also more more so in undergrad. And um, and I wanted to explore if I could combine writing and wanting to explore ideas and journalism felt like the perfect match. Of course, the question was, would anybody pay me to do journalism? And fortunately, somebody was ready. And so I've, I've stayed a journalist since. Um, I started at science because it was the obvious place for me as somebody who who's trained in the sciences. There was an appetite, and I think still there is in British journalism to have science-trained people doing some of the hard topics. And I think that's been a service to readers. Um, and it came sort of in the on the back of some uh, misinformation, disinformation that uh, happened around vaccines um, in, in the UK through science journalism. We can talk about that. Uh, but then I moved into climate uh, because of Donald Trump. It was his election campaign and he was talking about clean coal and my editors were like what is that and I had a chemical engineering degree and a chemistry degree and I said I I think I know a few things that I can try and explore and write more about so that's how I got into climate. Brilliant and um and you've done sort of deep digs on Exxon and 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 other things what has been your the the article that you wrote before the book I guess that you're most proud of or found most interesting biggest journey for you? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting way in which you put it. I've never called it investigative science journalism, but it kind of is. It's both investigative in trying to investigate whether an idea can work and if it is working, how it's working. But it's also an investigation in whether an idea is hype and why there is so much hype around it or if it is supposed to work, but it's not working, why it's not working. So uh, perhaps before the climate uh, well, one story that I can pick up is I wrote about what would be the next pandemic or what could be the next pandemic uh, in 2018 uh, for courts. Um, and, uh, and it was about taking a virus from West Africa, not from China, uh, that came from wild animals uh, and transferred into a human and then spread around the world. Um, which is still a risk, a uh, very real risk. Uh, but, you know, when the pandemic finally did hit and I'd moved on to climate by that time, um, I was very anxious because I understood the science and I understood what, uh, you know, sort of I'd, I'd investigated the science to understand how it would appeal, ap uh, apply to human um, humans and, and what it could do to the planet. So, um, yeah, that would be probably one story before before getting into climate that I'd pick. Wow. That that's uh, super interesting, and I, I want to come back to the journalism and writing piece, but you know, um, both because journalism feels like it has been um, on the vein rather than uh, booming, and as you say, it's quite hard to get paid for now. Everybody is um, is writing, um, so I want to come back to that maybe at the end a little bit, but um, then let's let's move, I guess, to to the to the book. How did you find writing it? What was different from from the investigative? I do think it's investigative science journalism because I've I've read a few of your pieces and they're really different to me at least. Um, so what made you think right? Actually, this could make a book. This should make a book. Yeah. Um. So in a way, the book is an extension of some of the reporting I'd started to do. Uh. But the reason to do it in a book form was that there hadn't been a book that I saw that made um, the case for how climate solutions are scaling all around the world, not just in Europe, not just in America, but also in China, but also in India, but also in island nations. Um, and that we have to fundamentally accept that we now live in this two-track world where because we will continue to put greenhouse gas emissions until we reach net zero, we will make this planet hotter and thus um, 
make human suffering uh, worse, but also extreme weather events worse, while at the same time, we are finally starting to also accelerate climate solutions. And those two things don't usually sit well together uh, in any person's head, even in my head, it's it's hard to compute sometimes. Um, and I felt like it required a, a book length approach to try and appreciate the solution side, because I think there are very many good books written about the climate impact side. Um, and so I was hoping that would uh, you know, appeal as a reader. Uh, but, you know, eventually it became climate capitalism because when my book editor was editing, um, she said, look, this is fantastic, but you're kind of arguing for these solutions to work in the economic system that we have, not overthrow it. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm a journalist, I'm looking at what's working and why it's, why it's working and how do you make it work? And that typically is the more practical way of doing things. And it's happening in this economic system. So it's not as much as a defense of capitalism as it is a um, sort of a framework for how to make capitalism work for climate solutions. Yeah. No, no. Um, and it struck me because your your premise really is that along that line of the Chomsky quote, that there isn't a conceivable possibility of overthrowing capitalism and managing the change we need in the timescale we need Um if we have to sort out capitalism first, it just isn't going to work. Um, and I guess the other side of that is that capitalism will always end in in the bad state of the world um, by nature. Um, and I, I would love to hear have you, whether you've had any of that criticism or kind of the challenge um, put to you um, on, yes, true, but... We can fix cap. We can work within capitalism, and and it will always yield the same the same result, i.e., a burning world or a world that's unequal, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the status quo. Um, what I am arguing for in the book is that status quo cannot remain the status quo because um, twofold. One is governments, you know, regardless of there being here and there a right wing movement trying to still puncture. Um, climate action, which will continue here and there, corporations that are going to try and slow down climate action, which will continue. Um, the tide has now turned, uh, mm -hmm. that there is serious understanding that this is a problem that needs to be solved and that there is an opportunity in solving that problem to solve other problems that society faces. Um, and that those could be different problems in developing countries. That's energy access in developed countries. It's global competitiveness. Uh, and so no longer is climate uh, just a problem on its own. Um, and so, so to me, that's why uh, I don't think the sort of, you know, capitalism's natural state is to just overconsume, overproduce and leave us in a state of a burning planet because climate because capitalism never operates in a vacuum it is always within a regulated system both by governments and by nature yeah. and sure governments have sort of lost their ability to really regulate capitalism well and that it, but it doesn't mean they don't have that power they still do and again through the case studies in the in the book i try and show where exactly and how exactly governments and international institutions can bring that power to bear. Brilliant. No, absolutely. I, um, I want to come back and dig into all the different elements of the framework that you, you lay out in the book. The, the first thing to say, and, and, and you sort of alluded to it there, is I love the fact you start the book with China and India um, in a book about capitalism, which is, you know, quite unusual. And um, and for me, that those are the areas I, I know less well um, than than some of the other examples and, and case studies you use. Um, but for a book that has capitalism in, in the title, it's really interesting that, A, so you start in China, um, and then you start with the story of a bureaucrat in, in China. And maybe um, for those people who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, will you tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. Wang, uh, the man that you you say has done more to grow the electric vehicle market than Elon Musk. And I'm looking at my 
colleague John Elkington who talks a lot about Elon Musk but I've never heard him talk about Wang Gang so I, I'm <laughs> here um when where did you come across him I've never heard of him um and what do you see as as the key lessons from from his story so maybe tell us a little bit about yeah. him yeah yeah so uh Wang Gang if you haven't heard of him uh and John it would be good to debate this at some point I believe has done more uh, to bring electric cars uh, to the world than Elon Musk has. Um, and I think that's becoming increasingly true uh, mm. given Elon Musk's antiques. Um, and he was born in China. Um, he uh, was born in a very tumultuous time. Uh, I was growing up in a tumultuous time called the Cultural Revolution where um, the Chinese government decided the urban elites uh, have uh, have spoiled culture and they need to go uh, to to villages to really know what 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 life is like and so universities were shut down and one gang um end, ended up in in a village uh farming but also repairing tractors and that's where he sort of found a love for uh, automobiles eventually universities opened up he studied auto engineering and got a um scholarship to go to World Bank, uh, a scholarship from World Bank to go to Germany uh, to study for a PhD. Mm-hmm. And he did that in in um, in uh, auto engineering, got a job in Audi, was very good, rose up the ranks, became head of production. It was about the year 2000 where at home in China, there was, a, there was an embarrassment that uh, the Chinese government continued to hell, uh, hold, which was their cars were just crap um and they had to rely on western technology to make any cars and so you had these joint ventures and you know you were kind of begging stealing technology to make your cars better and uh so in, as part of that there were these chinese ministers that visited lots of automaking giants including of course germany and were you know because knew somebody from china visited audi and he got to meet the science minister and he made the case to the science minister saying look if you want us to improve, us as in the Chinese, to improve auto engineering, stop thinking about the internal combustion engine. It's been worked on enough. We are never going to be able to catch up with the West. Think about a different form of uh, technology, but also a different fuel source because there's just not enough oil in the world. You know, Germans burned about 16 barrels of oil in 2000 per person per year, um, and Chinese burned one. And so if you're going to live that kind of lifestyle, there's just not enough oil. And so, you know, that was a very appealing idea to the Chinese government. Nobody was thinking about climate change per se at the time, but global competitiveness, a reduced energy bill, yes, please. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, air pollution was starting to take off, but it became a e- even more serious problem. So he comes back to China. He's given this secret program to try and develop an alternative um, fuel source technology. He wasn't Sure, it's hydrogen or batteries. If in, in uh, you know, he actually had a bias toward hydrogen more than he had ba- batteries. But you know, batteries won out as as the program ran, and he showcased those electric cars at the two thousand eight Olympics. And after that, that's the moment where the Chinese government realized our bill is still going up. Air pollution has now become a real problem, and it's not just the shame of our auto industry, but we are becoming the uh, laughing stock around the world for what we are doing to our uh, cities and the smog in them. And so all those confluencing factors allowed uh, the Chinese government to make one gun, the science minister. And over the next 10 years, and the, this is a story probably more people are familiar with, China goes on to become the world's largest maker of EVs and batteries. And the reason this is a story of capitalism is because it could not have done that next stage without private capital, without the likes of Warren Buffett coming in and investing in BYD. There were at one point 450 EV companies, mostly well-defined and experimental, but increasingly improved market that was being created by the Chinese government. So it's state-driven capitalism. Um, But none of this is a Chinese specialty. The Chinese learned how to do this from the Americans. The Americans are, you know, for all the paragon of capitalism that we think America is today, for almost every industry you can pick up, there is the fingerprint of government at the start of that industry. 
and I can just list a few if if that yes. helps. Um, so take the early rail network, radio stations, TV stations, the early semiconductor industry, the modern biotech industry. This is all non-climate stuff that has its root in how government incentives created that industry to happen. The auto industry itself, regardless of America, every country which has an auto industry has an auto industry only because of heavy government incentives yep. to ensure that auto industry survives through what are um, you know, pretty difficult times that a, a, an industry of that kind has to go through. And so um, that's the reason why this is capitalism, climate capitalism, because it is governments using their power to shape the market and then private industry innovating to fill what solutions the government is saying should be provided right now. Thank you. That That's a really eloquent and very precise um, explanation. And, and again, the book streams with this. So if you haven't read it yet, and they all, you know, then please do. Be, there's lots and lots to learn of these different pieces. Um, I st I still am not sure how you met, how you found him. Was that oh. just journalism? I'm yes, just... I think uh, his story is not. I mean, it's it's un un under told. It's not untold. Okay. Uh, you know, he was science minister. Of, a, of the second largest economy in the world uh, for a period of nine years. Uh, so he's not an unknown name. But as happens in China with a, with a communist government, they don't talk a lot. Uh, and so they are not out there on uh, X posting about their next crazy idea. Fair enough. No, no, that makes total sense. Um, and just on China. So we've had two other book club guests who've um, James Thornton, uh, founder of Client Earth, and most recently, last month, uh, Sir David King. And both of them talked in a, quite a lot of detail and with a lot of, I'm going to say, optimism and even warmth about China and the role in, in climate. So James Thornton has spent time um, helping the Chinese establish the, um, uh, the legal part of um of, of I guess the equation and training uh, judges in in environmental law. Uh, Sir David has has spent time advising on climate strategy and so on. How how do you see uh, with all the work you've done and and continue to do in your role as a journalist? I should say the you know the positive influence of China. Um, do you see that? Um, continuing and driving some of the climate the changes we need for climate or you know is there there's obviously a geopolitical risk that that gets um mm. derailed what do you what's your thinking yeah on? i mean if we again go back to sort of where china got it from is not a chinese innovation per se industrial policy that china is doing is yeah. stuff that west has done in the past uh what china has done is that it's done it at a time where it was forward thinking in its approach. And it was forward thinking in its approach, not from a climate perspective, primarily. Of course, it did understand the climate problem and it still does quite seriously, um, but more from a global competitive uh, perspective. Um, and that's where the West kind of lost that um, uh, race, so to speak. But a mm. um, few things to unpack in your question. First, we're still at a very early stage in pretty much every climate solution we want to deploy. Mm -hmm. The global stock of electric vehicles today is about 3%. There's 97 yeah. stock that needs to be turned over. Um, you know, uh, same thing with renewables. You know, the amount of solar panel or amount of solar and uh, wind that is providing electricity today globally is about 30%. There's still 70 more percent to be built. Um, Batteries, the same thing. Think about all the other climate solutions that are not yet at scale. There's plenty to play for. And so it's not a Chinese story done for. Uh, that's another thing to note. There is still room for the West to come up with an answer and try and catch up or, you know, compete. Um, and that would be a good thing. We want more competition on climate solutions, not on burning fossil fuels. Um, 
And the third thing is geopolitics has and will always play a role in uh, the world we're going to live through, uh, especially at the kind of scale at which uh, climate is a problem to the economy and kind of solutions are uh, a shot in the arm for the economy. Uh, these are trillion dollar uh, industries that we are talking about, where which means geopolitics is always going to be uh, at play. Um, so you have to make this work despite geopolitics, uh, not without it. No, that that um, that makes a lot of sense, and yeah. And the two can can to a certain extent shape each other, as you as you as you mentioned. Um, if we continue a little bit on on China, I'm going to dig a little bit. Well, or on actually one of the examples you use. So I mentioned that I love that you go into details and explain things um, through the book that people kind of assume everybody knows. So when you pick up, you know, whether it's how batteries really work or the cost of capital or solar power and, and, and especially the climate technologies, I feel it's very easy to band about and assume that we're all engineers. And I certainly am not. Um, so it's, um, thank you for doing that. Cause it, for me, I, I need the constant reminders of some of those things. Um, I just wondered at the, your description of your visit to CATL um, around, uh, you know, the world's largest battery maker. Would you just go into, you know, ex explain how, how did that feel? Because that, that yeah. must have been quite overwhelming, at least industrial things, I've visits I've made. I'm always yeah. astounded at the scale, um, which is not what it feels like when you read about it or see it on yeah. TV. Yeah, now this is a while ago. Um, I will say after I describe it to you, now finally CATL has allowed a camera to go into the uh wow. into their factory. So if you go if you go to YouTube and search for CATL factory, um and I think there's a there's a UK YouTube channel um uh that is an electric electric car channel. Um uh, those were the guys who got an access and, and you can see what it looks like. But it was a strange experience because I had not been to a battery factory before and nobody had warned me what it's going to be like. Um, and so I walk in and the first thing they say is put on uh, this uh, cap on your head and put on uh, these things on your shoes and give us your phone and wear this lab coat. And I'm walking in and I'm thinking, am I going into a hospital? Is this uh, an infectious disease ward? Uh, and then I walk in and it's white walls, very brightly lit, uh, glass everywhere. And it did feel like a hospital till you go and look into the window and you see all these large um, uh, pieces of equipment, mostly robotic, mostly actual robots moving on the factory floor with a few people around, uh, you know, making sure that the computers are doing the job. Uh, but uh, a battery making a little, you, you don't want what manufacturing. And so after the visit, all of that made sense, but the visual of it was um, quite um, strange. Yeah, no, um, I can I can only imagine the um, yeah that scale, and they've grown as you say as well, right? It's even since you were there. Yes, uh, twenty fold. So uh, the growth has been spectacular. Wow. Um, yeah, it's interesting because when you talk about potentially, you know, Europe or the West can start competing again on some of these things, we're we're kind of behind. <laughs> uh, so I think we have to be really specific about where we choose to to compete and what the technologies are that we might have the imagination to um, to come up with and, and how we then um, benefit from that rather than as with EVs. In a sense, Chinese are so good at learning um, and, and then implementing at large scale that we haven't been. Um, so we we just touched very briefly that you talk first about China and then about India. Um, what's your what's your sense? Because obviously you weave in sort of personal experience in um, the 
energy and electricity in India. Where do you think is is India going to hockey stick? You know, on these things in in a similar way to China, or where are you seeing this? And maybe, yeah, I would just be yeah. Curious. Yeah, I would say the the climate capitalism framework is quite different depending on the region you are. Um, so we talked about how China is state-driven capitalism, America is uh, subsidy-driven capitalism, uh, climate capitalism, where it's just Inflation Reduction Act with lots of tax credits to do go do green things. Europe is a, a heavy mix of punishment and some uh, carrots, so lots of sticks some carrots and trying to create rules around what counts as an investment, which areas to invest in. India in that world is much harder because it is not a rich country. So it doesn't quite have the capital to be able to deploy, um, uh, to give lots of tax credits and subsidies to industry. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is, uh, you know, is still a, a low middle income country, which means its governance is, is weaker. Uh, that needs to strengthen. Uh, but it is a place where when you do have a technology that's on the edge of being economic, it is adopted very quickly because it's a very price sensitive market. Mm. And so solar is the story I tell in India um, where, you know, in the, in the mid 2010s, solar just became at that price point, which was very attractive. And so India took on that solar journey and that's the company I talk about is Renew. But over the last two years, it felt like India was wobbling a little bit. It was uh, not doing all the things that were needed to actually take advantage of what is cheap solar. Um, and that was because India was trying to do some of its own manufacturing. It was trying to reshore some of its um, uh, solar panels rather than coming from China. And that meant it's, it, ha- you know, it, it forced a slowdown in the market, but that's now changed. This year, India has already in the first five months um, tendered more renewables, uh, solar and wind, uh, than it would for its annual target. So its annual target is about 50 gigawatts. In the first five months, it's already tendered 69 gigawatts. And so, um, and that's happening because India's electricity demand is rising very rapidly. With the kind of heat waves, you know, right now that India is suffering through, the demand for cooling is going up. Um, and so, uh, India wants everything it can deploy to try and get electricity uh, as cheaply as possible. That means building more coal power plants, but it also means really doubling down on renewables. Uh, so the Indian story is a story where whatever other countries do will help India become uh, drive its transition faster, but it's not going to be the place that drives the transition. Uh, the second story that I didn't write about, which is taking off in India now, is two wheelers and three wheelers, electric oh. two wheelers and three wheelers. Um, it's one of the fastest growing markets. Uh, you know, 92% of all electric vehicles sold in India today are two wheelers or three wheelers. Um, and, you know, that makes complete sense uh, from the type of consumer that, you, that there is in India. Two wheelers are just very, you know, it's a big mode of transport and they are cheaper. And um, the fuel cost um, wins that you get, the total cost of ownership is already uh, cheaper for electric vehicles uh, on two-wheelers and three-wheelers. And so that market is now taking off on its own. And, and produced mainly in India? Uh, the Batteries aren't yet. There's some battery manufacturing that's starting, but a lot of the, yes, two-wheelers and three-wheelers are produced in India. So the electric vehicles are produced in India. There are some Chinese uh electric two wheelers in india but mostly they're produced in india wow. not all parts but they're definitely um uh put together uh manufactured in india yeah um so interesting and and just um well i guess staying with the evs so i have a question and i can see a question in the chat so one question for me is you know do should we continue to protect the european um, auto manufacturers who quite frankly have been slow right um in in taking this up or should we say well tough luck we we shouldn't have tariffs and then related to that i can see richard has put a, a question in whether the biden administration's ev tariffs is that a good policy or a bad policy to yeah you? yeah um 
very very interesting and really important life questions right now. Uh, the best way I could think about it is, of course, if you ask economists, they'll tell you two things that they would almost all agree on without reservations. Uh, one is trade is good. Mm -hmm. Two, migration is good. Um, because trade gives you comparative advantage the country that makes something cheaper trades with the other country that makes something else cheaper and everybody wins and migration is good because the right talent goes to the right place and enables this to become the comparative advantage even stronger mm -hmm. the trouble with this is that even as those might be principally right uh in theory they never play out quite as well there's something called a stickiness factor where people don't move. Yes. And that means it's not like all the manufacturers in America have ended up in China and all the coders in China have ended up in America. And there's comparative advantage for China to be the factory of the world and America to be the digital factory of the world because people don't move. And that's why you get middle America and you get a right wing point and you get Trump. Uh, and so what you do get with the tariff wars is a political is is a political economic output right it's it's trying to make the politics work alongside the economics and that means um that pull and push will be there constantly there and so rather than is it good policy or bad policy the better way to ask the question is to accept the reality that tariffs will be used by governments how to use them better uh, is the, you know, what is a good tariff policy and what is a bad tariff policy? That is the, the debate to be had rather than whether we should have tariffs or not. Right. Um, and and the, the way that the Biden one has come out, do you think? That Again, I, yeah. So the, on that, I would say I don't have uh, enough of a detail yeah, I, view to say what is good tariffs and what is bad tariffs. I think because we, as a as 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 experts, haven't had that discussion. So you know, I I try and keep myself clued up to what the latest conversation is, but I don't think the economists themselves have come to a conclusion. What kind? What would be the best way to do this? Uh, um, but you will see government sometimes going ahead of. Um, um, sometimes going ahead and, and deploying these policies because they are needed and they are popular and that's what yeah. will win them um, votes. You know the thing, yeah. The thing that would be crucial in climate capitalism framework is that they also then be agile. That if they get something wrong, they change it. Mm -hmm. uh, that if there's a bad tariff policy, come up with a good one. Uh, and that doesn't happen often enough. And I think that is perhaps right now a bigger failure than uh, whether governments are doing enough or not on yeah. climate. And could I add to that? Whether they're ready to change their mind about it. Yeah. Could I add to that? Also, how they communicate that, right? The, mm, 100%. It, it feels like there, there's a lot of very blunt, both policies, but also... Um, communication around those policies which are yes. causing more grief and more polarization than actually it might have needed to be the case do you think so much and i think the best case <laughs> of the worst example is the uk yeah. <laughs> um where there is clear good policy in place with the climate change act with a climate change committee that gives you clear advice on what needs to be done um which if a political party really wanted to use to its advantage, it could use through better communication of the policy it itself has, has deployed, which is the Conservative Party, mm. um, and show what advantages that brought to people uh, and does enable them to go further on climate policy rather than make it a culture war issue, which uh, is clearly backfiring as we are seeing in the local election. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, and uh, I just saw a poll of uh, you, you um, yeah. of under fifty year olds, and uh, conservatives tied with the Reform Party at eight uh, percent, and Labour was fifty nine percent. I mean, they're really getting walloped by uh, yes. young people. Right. And um, and maybe yeah. So so with the UK, because obviously um, the book was written before before the current government started reneging on their targets and, and all those things. Um, 
So, um, uh, yeah, so the next edition, which there'll obviously be several editions, I'm assuming that's going to be be edited somehow. <laughs> there'll be an extra comment about what happened next, which will be interesting. Um, well, I hope that people can take this and, and show it to the Conservative Party that the that the Climate Change Act came under, uh, you know, OK, yes, it was passed by Labour, but it only happened because the Conservatives under David Cameron were clamouring for it. Uh, and that once that happened, Conservatives are the party that brought net zero. You know, somebody just give them a little history lesson. And no, that would be ideal. And yeah, it's probably too late for them, as you say, with the new you. <laughs> I hadn't seen that 8%. That's that's quite interesting. Do you, um, How much do you think, really, that, and, and let's start with the UK, but maybe go to a couple of the other elections, because it's obviously happening in lots of places, that that climate and the handling of climate capitalism will be on that agenda. Um, in the UK, it's interesting. Has it has there been permanent damage done by by as you say, drawing climate up as a culture war issue? Yeah, it's a it's a very interesting question. I don't have a very good answer. I only have examples. So. Um, the examples that I'm learning from, and, and maybe there is a way to unify them, and maybe there isn't because the politics are just complicated, which is that in places where there has been not enough climate action, we know that climate can be a winning cause. It happened in the 2020 US election. Um, you know, it wasn't just about COVID, but it was also about the Green Deal, yes. it, you know, um, and same thing happened in the Australia elections in 2022, where after nine years of the Liberal Party, which is the Conservative Party there, um, and, and their sort of, you know, pretty um, anti-climate stance, you had uh, not just Labour, but really independent candidates who were yes. much more climate forward, who were brought into power, happened in Brazil with uh, in the case of Lula. Um, but of course, at the same time, for all these examples, you can have the exact opposite ones, right? The UK moving on its right wing uh, twist. Um, the same thing happening across probably in the European elections that are, are coming up in June. Uh, but probably what might happen in the US election uh, where you, you get uh, more anti-climate stance. So um, I think, you know, at least the, the one thing that is probably generalizable now uh, 10 years on from Paris Agreement is that climate can no longer be just put in a box and mm -hmm. left behind. It's always there in the top five issues. And I think that's not going away because just look at the extreme weather events. They are not going to calm down anytime soon, nowhere in the world. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And and actually just um, this sort of that idea of, of box, the... Um, I, I noted the, I really liked the chapter on Sarah Breeden at the Bank of England. Um, and also because there are not that many women in the book. I have to just say that out loud. Um, we don't have to talk about that right now. But but what I really liked about that chapter was that, it you know, she's reframing the scope of action for the Bank of England by drawing the link that safety and soundness of in financial institutions, which is her mandate, they are at risk because of climate risk. And so it, it reminded yeah. me of, and we're seeing the same with companies that we work with as we're helping them assess their political footprint, you know, what their lobbying is, what their indirect lobbying through trade associations is. Um, this reframe that that no organization in or, or type of organization in the framework can just be inside their own box. Everything has become yeah. political, but also personal. Um, yeah. And I just, um, I wanted to, you know, do we need to change our frameworks in a sense and, and some of those more fundamental pieces and say, everybody has a common responsibility, whatever, t whether you're a bank, uh, you know, a central bank, whether you're a financial institution or, or a, a corporate, you have a, you actually have a, a, a responsibility, let alone a mandate to look at what the collective needs, what society needs at this stage, or the economy needs, however you want to phrase it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I let's address the women question though um, first before I answer that question. And it's a it's a fair question, and I, I you know I thought a lot about it as I was writing about it. One is it's a reflection of what the book is. So the book is trying to uh, address largely energy emissions, and the energy industry is largely men, yes. even today. 
And that is a reflection of where you get the energy stories um, that have almost all of them men. You know, the one uh, energy story I have of an oil industry in there has a woman in in, yes. in power. And, and the reason is not because I featured her because she's a woman, but because she's the only one uh, who's doing something interesting in the oil industry space right now. Uh, maybe that's because she's a woman and that she, you know, we, uh, because of facing uh, uh, all all sorts of barriers in that industry, um, was strengthened enough to be able to make a um, strong enough to be able to make a really hard, difficult case happen. Um, but um, so I think that's that's reflection of the industry I was covering. Um, but also uh, some of the other things in you know the places where women do feature you know uh, the story of Bryony Worthington in in sort of um bringing through the UK climate change act um you know there are still roles where women are actually leading and a lot of the policy work for example women are leading in those spheres uh and so you start to see more women in the second half of the book uh where that work is happening including sort of Sarah Breeden that you talked about so um and then coming to the question about every entity has a role. I think that has been kind of now made easy because of the science, because of the IPCC 1.5C report that get, gave us net zero, that tells us that every entity has to play a role, 100%. I think what is also something that the IPCC report made clear, but implementing is much harder, is that despite every entity having its own goal, there has to be enough collaboration between these entities. Not everybody has to work together yeah. and the world will be a better place. Of course, that <laughs> will be hands. true. No. It's never gonna happen, but that enough of them have to come together enough number of times to actually make progress happen. And so that to me is, uh, you know, hopefully comes through in the book, but also, things that I explore, which is what beyond just carbon makes people want to act on climate? Uh, yes. What are other motivations that enable the, these sorts of collaboration to happen? Like is one that has been underappreciated now starting with more attention, air pollution, energy access, global competitiveness, um, technology innovation. All those things are parallel motivations to act on the carbon problem that are helping reduce emissions but don't have to be just about emissions yeah no no i think that's right the um just looking at and i can see suddenly lots of questions are coming up in the chat so i'll just i'll um i'll pick some and read out the when we look at then um another actor we've talked about companies and and sort of technology we've talked about um to a certain extent policy and politicians and 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 so on um investors so uh, there's i guess we we've been involved in the impact investment and and sort of new types of investment for for a long time or on the sidelines of um you you seem like really convinced that that um the ESG sort of investors and then the the activist investors are um are key to this, um, which I would agree with. Some of them are now backing off. So I think um, that's really interesting. And um, yeah, and, and Al I can see Alex Watson has said, really like the engine number one chapter. And you said that increasingly the champions of uh, capitalism want climate to be a problem that c capitalism can solve rather than worsen. And he would love to know uh, what ventures you are tracking in the world of finance, other than engine number one, um, that you think are, worth, are working to sort of turbocharge the shift. So yeah. who, who are you seeing apart from people like engine number one? Um, so one way to try and answer this question is to look at the fact that a lot of the initiatives on climate first started off as either voluntary initiatives with companies wanting to take a leadership role. Um, so the example of Unilever is in the book, which talks about this company taking a lead on its own uh, ahead of competition. Um, but 
voluntary only takes you so far. And so what has happened in the investor space is that there has been a lot of voluntary work that has happened. So uh, carbon disclosure projects, CDP, how to improve and report on non-financial metrics that was almost all voluntary and took off for um, quite some years and is now tens of thousands of companies that report on uh, those CDP uh, databases. Um, but voluntary only goes so far. And so till governments regulate it, you know, investors initially were able to make use of that data to some extent to make those decisions. But there are limits to how much, how useful that data can be for investment decisions. So mm. eventually regulations have to come in and they need to uh, help investors formulate those decisions better. But because the politics has taken a little bit of a turn, those regulations, for example, in the US have not come through at the pace as which you would want. And in the EU where they have come through, there has been um, perhaps too much regulation or poorly done regulation that is now having to walk back and now having to re redo its ESG regulation. And so we're in a messy place for the investor base. Um, but what hasn't changed is that climate impacts keep getting worse. So look at what's happening to the insurance industry, especially in the US, but globally. Mm -hmm. The amount of money that they're having to pay out is growing is growing um those are also the same industries that are investing in a lot of other types of uh places to make a return right insurance industry is a, a heavy multi-trillion dollar industry with assets that it would like a return on so that it can pay out uh to people who want um payouts or, or need payouts um and so the fundamental that investors need to act on climate risk hasn't gone down. Yeah. How they act has become messy uh, and there isn't a good place to be yet. Uh, so to me, from a climate capitalism perspective, you know, uh, the question that uh, Alex asked was, who am I looking to? Um, I'm looking towards what Europeans do. So uh, look at what uh, the Norges Bank, the Nor Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is yeah. doing now on ESG. It's very interesting. Um, look at some of the pension funds across Europe and what they are doing on ESG. Um, the Dutch pension fund just recently dumped $10 billion of fossil fuel uh, stocks because it's, it said it had had enough. It had done all the engagement it could. These companies have turned around and they are not going to help them meet their net zero goals. And so they're dumping them even though they are profitable. Um, look at what uh, some of the pension funds in the US are doing. So CalPERS, which is a California pension fund, yeah. and how it is going after Exxon. So you're sort of in the stage two of the Exxon saga with engine number one. With now Exxon, because it's so profitable, is suing its own shareholders. Nice. Uh, and so, yeah, so it, you know, we live in a very interesting time um uh, but the <laughs> stories are not always sorry yeah, i was just going to say living in an interesting time i believe is a curse in certain countries <laughs> <laughs> um no i agree um and and alex I, i'm going to make a pitch for the climate safe lending um network as well i think they're doing quite interesting things a network rather than specific actors um just you you touched really briefly on you you know that the the conditions have changed somewhat so you know the backlash i guess um particularly in the us and we 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 can refer that to sometimes to very clumsy bad regulation um and and political games played by one of our types of actors in our framework um do you think that is there anything i guess and I don't know exactly when you, you know, I do know roughly when you wrote the book, but do you think that there's anything you would reconsider when you you think about that that backlash and what has happened? So you were kindly enough, you know, being Danish, you mentioned Erstel, which I was very pleased with. Um, they've, they're have they going through quite a tough time at the moment. Um, similarly, Unilever and their leadership position. I was a couple of weeks ago at their head office where they were explaining why they've um, sort of concentrated their effort, let's say, on 
on four priorities um, rather than than aiming to take broad sustainability leadership across everything as they have done for years. Do you think that backlash, what, what kind of effect do you think that's having? And, and what would you, if you're going to write a footnote to those, those chapters of the book, what, what would that look like? Yeah. Um, so there, there, there is a little bit of mixing and muddling happening here because there is political backlash in some corners, especially in the US, mm -hmm. but it's also happening at a time where there is, let's say, macroeconomic backlash, right? The high interest rates are just terrible for uh, a capital intensive climate solutions industry. And so um, that's not helping the cause alongside the politics. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the third factor, which is, uh, a lot of the problem right now is around how quickly to build. So supply chains are an issue, they're now kind of sorted, but the building part, getting permissions uh, from government to be able to deploy all the things that you need to deploy isn't happening fast enough in the West. And so the backlash is a combination of all these three things. It's not just the politics. Uh, and so the Oster story is very much that, right? The, actually, the political backlash for Oster is not that much. Uh, you know, yes, sure, somebody in the U.S. will complain about offshore wind and whales, um, because why not? Uh, but apart from that, it's really the, the supply chain, the high interest rates, and the permitting uh, issues that have um, caused Oster to struggle uh, in the U.S. So places where I would, again, my instinct would be to one try and a investigate the reasons and that's what i did right now with the austria story but then to look at places where things are being solved and this is a story i haven't yet fully reported on but i know as an example so germany is one sort of positive story in this um last two years uh where even though it can't really do anything about interest rates, one thing it has done about uh, done about this is it has made permitting easier. What exactly it has done to make permitting easier and how it's finally starting to deploy again wind uh, power at at a pace that Germany should be building it or even faster is an interesting story. And I haven't quite nailed all the reasons that it's been able to do it, uh, but the but the executives in Vestas and Austria tell me. You know, I tell people go to the Germans and learn what they did, right? Uh, so where are the places? What are the bottlenecks? These will change as the transition progresses. And um, yeah, you know, as a journalist, my goal is to try and figure out what is working, how it's working, what is not, not working and why it's not working. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And um, and it is interesting to to, to hear those different um, and planning. I, th I think Labour's top of their manifesto, right, at this point in the UK to, to reform a lot of their planning laws, because what I'm hearing here. So I'm at a um, at a, a um, Im impact investment um, gathering, I guess, here in Oslo, Catapult Future Fest. And um, and a lot of the conversation today was around the harder environment for investing um in in climate tech solutions um that that, that it's it has slowed down to a certain extent um i want to talk about targets for a little bit because you give a great example of india's 2015 goal of 100,000 megawatts hours of solar by 2022 this idea of scaling 20 times in 7 years which is you know incredible um and yet they keep extending that target which is fantastic how important do you think they have um that having targets that might seem completely unreachable been and because a lot of people have said well this is you know scotland has now rolled back unilever all these pieces um so i'd love to to just hear how important yeah. they are yeah it's an interesting moment i mean i suppose uh we should talk about the 1.5 c target which uh yes. by all by all climate scientists perspective is likely to be breached and yet is that a good enough reason to stop aiming for 1.5 c a lot of mm. people say no, because even if that goal is not reachable, the faster we reach towards it, the better it would be. Um, yeah. Now, goal setting itself is also sometimes culturally sens sensitive. So 
uh, a very nice example of this is how the West for the past five years after or for the uh, five years after Paris Agreement was signed was trying to convince the Chinese to come up with a target to peak its emissions, at least come up with a date to peak your emissions. Do it by 2025. And the Chinese were like, no, don't make a set goals, et cetera, et cetera. Eventually, they agreed to setting a goal that was 2030. If all the data is right, we just got news earlier this week, yesterday, that Chinese emissions in March declined by, I think, it was 2.5%. Yeah. Um, and that is structural decline. It's not because the economy is slowing down. It's because Chinese coal consumption is falling and its renewables deployment is starting to make that coal consumption fall. Yeah. And so if that stays on, and of course, we will never know for some time, but if that stays on, China has peaked its emissions in 2023, before 2025, which the West wanted it to do, and before yeah. its 2030 target. So in, in the Chinese case, they almost always set a target and then over deliver. Um, that's not the case here in the West. In the West, it's typically set a target and then under deliver and then set a new target. Uh, but I think targets help. I think targets are helpful in focusing the mind, even if they are not always fully achievable. Um, and they enable multiple actors to align their activities um, towards a target. And I think um, I, you know, now that we talk about it, it, feels like it would be the right place for somebody in the right wing establishment to try and attack targets because that will really start to undo a lot of the alignment that does exist. And so I'm sure yeah. we'll see that at some point. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And um, so personally, I would like to see a sort of almost morph targets into the missions that Mariana Matsukato talks a lot about um, because you have to have that high level of ambition where you can envisage something different to achieve it and i think you're you know on the 1.5 i think we have breached it right um I feel yeah like well last... i mean we i haven't we, breached we... it yet but we are likely to i mean the, yeah, the 1.5 yeah. breaching is if it stays above 1.5 yeah. no, no, yeah, exactly but it, but it seems yeah. it seems we can't not have gone above it uh, I, I feel like johan rockstrom said eventually um yeah. That, but we but still have I think the point you were making is interesting, yeah. which is that rather than just one goal, it's also a time maybe we should have multiple goals. So another place which has done really well with goals is the Department of Energy mm -hmm. um, in the US. They have set out these goals around, uh, for example, I the density cool of thing, the yes. <laughs> Sorry. density of the energy density of the battery or the cost of deploying solar. Uh, now they're doing one on carbon removal and how much a ton of carbon removal should cost. And that is not a government target. It's an innovator target. Yeah. It's telling the industry, this is what we think is actually possible technologically. Let's aim for it. And yeah. I think let's have a flourishing of targets. Well thought out, though. Yeah, no, exactly. Well thought out. Oh, and I can see... Um... That Mahendra Kumar Chuan is saying, in your judgment, and we've talked about China, whether they uh, and India are on track for their net zero target, and what can be done to accelerate those. So we talked about China, India. Uh, real struggle. So until about six months ago, I would have said India is really struggling. Uh, this past quarter has been spectacular. Uh, in India's growth story, as I talked about, it's got, you know, 69 gigawatts of renewables tendered in a year when it really needs to do only 50. Um, but uh, India has a lot of problems that it needs to address um, around clear target setting, around clear in, you know, it can't provide a huge amount of subsidy, but it does have the capacity to provide some amount of subsidy. Um, and, you uh, there is right now not enough being done on the policy side in India, which means there's not enough done being done on the industry side yeah. uh, in India because policy leads on climate typically. Will it? Do you think it will change after the, the these next elections? Maybe. I mean, uh, elections are always a time where it becomes a little less certain, uh, and so we'll see what the election results show. I mean, it's um, it's the counting's due to start this weekend, and so we'll know very soon. Yeah, yeah. It's. It, I was going to say it's very soon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um. So I'm. I'm just. I'm going through some of the, the more of the questions that I'm seeing coming in. Um. Because I think targets 
are super interesting. The um, maybe I'll just jump down here. I can see Cormac um, has asked. He says, um, first, thank you for for giving the time. Um, as you detail, there are transformational alternative technologies in advanced development that promise to decarbonize the, virtually all of the hard to decarbonize industries, but the normal slow and steady scale, a scale up isn't quick enough. Any thoughts on how to greatly accelerate all of that? And thank you again. Yeah, so hard to decarbonize uh, industries, I'm assuming steel, cement, uh, sustainable aviation fuels, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I do go into it right. uh, a little bit in the book. Um, yeah. I address the cement question in the book uh, yes. and what it takes to uh, uh, do cement. I think what um, is perhaps one that can be applied across uh, a, diff a few different domains um, is what uh, a group called First Mover Coalition is doing, but it's basically yes. advanced market purchases. You bring yeah. a group of uh, like-minded actors, large enough, who want a green solution, who are willing to pay a premium for that green solution because, for example, it really doesn't matter to Microsoft how much the cement costs in a data center, um, but it matters how much the emissions are. And so it's willing to pay twice or thrice if it if it if that's what it takes. Um, but you bring those together, you make enough of a market, and then you go out and you create a company that will supply it. So we saw in a Swedish company called H2 Green Steel yeah. using that advanced market purchase to raise four and a half billion euros in debt for a startup that is only four years old. It's yeah. unheard of. It's, it's of sort of showing how other climate tech companies can really go into the billions of dollars of money raised now rather than the, the hundreds of millions that have become commonplace yeah. um so that i think is a very good place for hard to decarbonize industries to um start to scale up the the activity uh and if certainly we need we should stop calling them hard to decarbonize because yeah we, we have to decarbonize them anyway so yeah. we might as well imagine it have to de yeah let's let's move to have to decarbonize them <laughs> yeah. yes Cormac, did that answer your question just not yeah e excellent louis thanks and, and thanks asha super answer thanks very much wonderful thank you um oh i'm looking at suddenly time as well it's flying um greg has, greg watson has put in um two questions we'll we'll do them because they look fairly fairly simple so one do you see risk of a small company large company divide emerging as we address sustainability and do you feel that there are enough large company collaborations with SMEs to meet net zero and other targets? That's a great question. Thank you, Greg. It takes us Very a good question. Time. Yeah. Yeah, really hard question too. So no, I mean, uh, all our tools right now from target setting to uh, decarbonization plans to corporate PPAs for renewables are all sort of really geared towards large companies because you know, let's face it, those are the companies that, you know, have the money and are willing to act on climate and have investors and shareholders on their throat wanting to, to get them to do more on climate. So all the confluencing factors that brought large industry together. Great. Good to have that. Um, but the only place where the small and medium enterprise is getting a push uh, is when the large industry is not able to cut enough of its scope three emissions, its supply mm -hmm. chain emissions, and then it's going to the small and medium enterprise, which is contributing to their scope three and wanting to change them. And they are struggling, um, yes. as we've seen uh, in multiple uh, cases, you know, SBTI, the science-based targets initiative body that uh, is sort of a watchdog of net zero goals, has had multiple companies uh, get out of the program because they're not able to meet their targets and stay on them. And so um, that is a is a is a real problem. Um, and some there are some people who are starting to do uh, work on this. Uh, there's a group called We Mean Business uh, that has been thinking about SMEs and has done some work across Europe on SMEs. Yeah. Um, but you know, I have not seen much work on SMEs in India, which are like the backbone of Indian industry. Well, um, so yeah. yeah, it's a very good question. No, I think it's a great question, and. Um... 
maybe I could just add. So, so we do a bit of work with Sage, the accountant software, um, the only tech company on the FTSE 100. And they're very committed on the sustainability front, interestingly, to help um, SMEs sort these these issues and 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 understand it but that it feels to me like there's quite a lot of investment needed in educating um smes and giving them tools to deal with it right because part of it is just a lack of resources um that is common for for most small medium businesses um i'm gonna make sure we get to all these questions there's a few more we'll just there's a quick one from lucy philby thank you lucy lovely to see you again um the, are industry targets more powerful than national targets, or do you need both? Um, and I should explain, probably I can give a bit of background. So Lucy uh, works for South of Scotland Enterprise, so brilliantly is working to decarbonize um, industry across South of Scotland. Um, with... Yeah, I'm just going to so just um yeah so she's working on that so i'm i'm assuming that's going to be a little bit of background to her question is it Lucy? yeah you know do you do you go um, I'm, it's a, it's and being in scotland yeah. <laughs> and being in scotland with no interim target at the moment so <laughs> yes there is no 2030 target right um uh, i think uh, it's a good question it's it's very rare to see the sort of situation Scotland is in where there isn't an interim target from a, a you know a climate forward country um but I don't know if it's either or I feel like both are necessary hmm. government targets because they are broad-based uh broad-based economy targets can help align industries uh to that target hmm. um it's the problem with industry targets. Those are typically voluntary, and how much can you scale a voluntary uh, target setting? Um, yeah, I think that's where, like, you know, industry groups, they do an important job. Sometimes they lobby against climate regulations, but, you know, as a voice, it, it's important for industry to talk uh, among themselves. But voluntary only goes so far. So I feel like government, you know, if given a choice, I would choose government targets um, more than I would choose the industry targets because government targets dictate industry targets. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions on um, around capitalism as a whole. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with one from Laurie, uh, who says, do you have thoughts on the tension between capitalism's foundation of chasing consumer demand and growth versus the physical need to actually reduce resource yeah. use? And I'm going to, there's a little extra, and any thoughts on how, who is making the necessary government decisions, key policies, infrastructure, et cetera, similar to the question in the beginning? Yeah, I will say that uh, it's, it's really instinctive and appealing to think about, of course, we need to reduce resource use. Um, and without that, there's no way to solve the problem. Um, and and then blame capitalism for obviously just wanting more resource use. Um, mm -hmm. There are a few ways in which I'd like to answer that because I've thought about this a lot now. One is that um, resource use, is, as much as there, there are finite material resources, we do not have finite energy. So you can use a lot of energy. You know, we're bathed in solar power to do a lot more economic work and growth while keeping resource use limited. Uh, and so that to me is the answer to sort of the degrowth growth problem. There is a lot of economic growth that can be had without extra increase in resource, material resource consumption. The second one is that even before we come to reduction in material use, and we should really do that you know, as, as much as we can, we have been doing some of it through efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, take the copper price of copper, iron, and aluminum over the last 300 years. Adjusted for inflation, they haven't gone up very much because we just become much more uh, efficient at using those materials. Because once the price goes up, you either find a new material or you start to use less of it. Which is not to say it's the solution to the problem, but it is happening. So let's acknowledge that. The third one is our recycling rates are terrible. And we yes. know 
I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of plastic recycling rates, right? Less than 10%. Yeah. But even things like glass, paper, steel, aluminum, copper, our recycling rates are far below 95%, which, the, what, which is what they should be. You know, paper recycling rates in India are 30%. In the US, they are 60%. Um, same thing is true of uh, steel. Uh, yeah. You know, India, India, India's steel recycling rate is only 50%. Uh, America, it's 60%. Uh, India's copper recycling rate is really great, 90%. But um, in 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 the US, it's it's closer to 70%. And so there's so much room to improve recycling rates and thus re- reduce resource primary resource consumption. We are not doing that. Um, so I think we're jumping a few guns ahead to try and say, use less resources when you can actually make better use of the resources we have today um, and do go a lot far in the net zero transition before you have to finally address the question of, okay, now we just have to reduce consumption. Yeah. Okay. No, no, that makes, hopefully that answers the question. I think that was a really good answer actually. Um, but it does lead me to, I guess, um, something it's a big question so we'll just do it briefly because we've got nine minutes left only um which is around sort of techno optimism um and and at least uh, a challenge i've heard waged at both bill gates and i would say you know in the same sentence could be you uh you know do we really think that this is this is going to do it can we do it fast enough uh, there, there was some new research out from Earth for All, and I think based on Oxfam research, saying that the evidence says we cannot solve the climate crisis without addressing um, and solving poverty and um, in a sort of serious inequality at the same time. We can't do one. We can't say oh, we'll just do techno and do climate and then yeah. get to things. Yeah. So just what? And, and I'm actually not going to do the challenge directly to you because I'm sure you've had. No, no, it's fair. But, but no, no, I'm happy to take what, it. What's the interesting, um, what's the interesting pieces of that challenge, and where 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 do you see that? R- rather than straight yeah. up, challenging you, I, you must have talked about this before. Yeah. No, no, no. I think it's fair. I think if you look at climate capitalism, it's not a techno optimistic book at all. If I had to write a techno optimistic book, I would be writing a book about fusion and hydrogen and lab grown meat. Um, None of the things that have scaled up uh, and will will take a while, but, you know, I have optimism that they will, right? Like if I had to write that book, I would have written that book. Um, So no, it's not a techno-optimistic book at all. If anything, it's a policy-optimistic book. It's trying to say you can use policy to drive the transition uh, and and drive business. Um, uh, But I would also say that in a way, my job to answer this question has been made easier because Hundreds of thousands of scientists are telling us this is doable, right? The IPCC report, which is a summation of all the science that exists and the the scenarios that they've developed, are scenarios that say over the next 70 years, we can grow our economy, address poverty, address energy access, address sustainable development goals, and reduce emissions to zero and go negative. I am not saying that. This is not airy-fairy dreamy utopian thinking this is practical real scientists who argue and fight and do not let anything that uh is not backed by other hundred people get out on paper saying it and it's there in a 40 page summary published by the ipcc so i think techno optimism i have it because i am a scientist at heart and i love technology and but i never rely on it and we should never rely on it but we should be, I think, techno-optimistic as a species. We should want new technologies for progress, but that's got nothing to do with climate. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's, you know, I love I love the innovation and the technology as well that in, in general, but it is, I think it is such a fair challenge. Um, actually, it dovetails into, and we're gonna just do two or three more questions. Um, Kami asks, how can we integrate that hope and optimism into our acceptance of where we are in the present, where it can feel hopeless, especially yeah. from sort of a citizen point of view, um, change isn't coming fast enough. If we're all optimistic, do we delay action and put the burden on emergent tech, young people, and so on? Well, it's a philosophical question, so I will get a little philosophical about it, which Go is, 
every day I think about this in some way or another, maybe not directly, but we are all a manifestation of a possible outcome, right? We could be somebody else. You know, our parents could not have met, some, somebody else would have met and we were not born. So we are all manifestation of possibilities. And what we have in front of us is scientists telling us the possibilities that exist for us to reach, for us to choose. Um, and to me, that gives me the most hope, optimism, which is that it is within our grasp to do it. Um, and of course, you can look back and feel overwhelmed as I do because I have, I'm have i a climate journalist and I have to look at these events from all kinds of angles, including all the impacts that we see. And you can feel uh, disheartened why the system isn't changing. But then you turn around and you say, you are a part of the system and you have agency over that system. And even if that agency is small, you can grow that agency. Uh, and here are all the examples through which those agencies have been used and changes have been made. So I am a possibilist rather than a optimist or a, or a pessimist. Uh, there are possibilities and we choose which ones we want. Um, thank you. Um, I really like that. Um, there's a very quick question, I guess, from Catherine um, in terms of, and I'll shorten it, apologies, Catherine, um, your experience of climate literacy in boardrooms um, that mm. many companies are not treating that as urgently as they should. Um, how do we move the dial on really genuine input into their business strategy on that? Yeah, uh, the first step would be climate awareness, then there would be climate literacy. Uh, I think climate awareness is where we can be a little more positive that there is at least awareness at a board level about climate issues now. Climate yeah. literacy, we're still far behind. Uh, and there's so much room to do more. Um, people with agency can can take that as a real real thing that can have a huge impact. Um, in recent, because of book events, I've uh, met uh, a network of non-executive uh, directors of boards, uh, NED, this is the group of NEDs, and they are actually quite interested in climate issues now. These people who have been experienced uh, individuals, uh, you know, towards the end of their career, retired, and now sit on the top of boards uh, in corporations. They are thinking about climate more and more, uh, but you know, they, they could do help with all this informed crowd that's attending the, the book club today. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, exactly that, that the boards, you know, there's a lot of people on boards and, and they haven't been educated. So we need to create both safe ways that they can, can learn the facts, not the opinions, um a little bit faster and just the, you know what they need really because um they don't need to be experts um i'm just gonna well jump into two things um sort of uh, the very very end i said i was going to talk about journalism um again because i think it's really interesting and you don't really mention it so much in the book but what you do say is that it is clearly um, cheaper now to solve the crisis by tens of trillions of dollars to solve the crisis than to miss the goals. And yet that is a story we almost never hear. I'm always railing at the radio or wherever when it says, this, you know, the Climate Change Committee says it's going to cost this much to get to net zero. And I think, well, what's it going to cost if we don't get there? Um, so, on, you know, where is the media? That's not the question. Mm. Uh, but um, I would love to hear your thoughts on how the media, and especially maybe young people who want to write, who you know know that journalism is dead. So how how can the but how can the media start changing that picture? And that links to Harriet's question, which will be the last one I'm going to take, yeah. which is oh, which is about um do you think really that um a, a major global crisis or a tipping point like a breakdown of the atlantic current or melting of the antarctic ice sheets or something like that could change um sort of the fact that um climate capitalism is our, is our only option and our sort of over yeah. so 
so so those two questions i guess put together yeah. and yeah uh i'll take the second because it's easier to answer in a way which is that i hope not uh i don't know if there has been any past event that has made us suddenly change uh, everything and make it perfect, right? Take the COVID-19 pandemic and yes, it killed a year ago because of technology mostly, but also some of it because of us taking action of wearing masks, et cetera, and, and isolating and being able to isolate because of Zoom. Um, but where is pandemic preparedness today? I mean, the avian, <laughs> avian flu right now, which is crossing over to humans in multiple places in the world, barely gets a mention uh, in the news when you talk to the to infectious disease scientists they're really worried about the avian uh, flu jumping mm -hmm. over and causing a an influenza pandemic which was what the spanish flu was um so i think it's it's i would not wa i would not put my chips on a a single event of any kind however massive it be giving us the the way to fix the system or finally making us all believe in the same system. Okay. Uh, it's rarely that change happens that way. Um, and so it's just better to use climate capitalism and all the framework and all the multiple motivations to actually try and get the solutions going. Um, and on journalism, there is, again, it's kind of a two-stage reality. On the one hand, Climate journalism has actually been getting much better over the past 10 years. Uh, uh, more newsrooms, there are more climate journalists today in the world than there were 10 years ago. Uh, most large newsrooms have uh, more climate journalists than ever before. Um, and yet at the same time, the, the journalism industry is suffering from a real business uh, model crisis. Now, that one I really do not have an answer for. And I, you know, I, my paycheck kind of depends on having an answer to that question. And it, it, there isn't a good one. Um, the only reason hope if I've seen any is that AI for whatever promise it makes, isn't able to separate fact from fiction. And that makes a, a journalism more valuable than it would have been considered valuable before the AI hype. So um, hopefully society will see it and pay for it. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Um, we've gone over time, which is quite unusual for me. Um, I'm normally very strict on that, but it's been fascinating. Um, and lots of positive comments in the um, in the chat. I'm sad that you say you don't have a book project lined up for the next one because I, I, well, I, really... I am thinking a lot about electricity right now. Electricity in all forms, going back to 1600 to the birth of electricity and how, you know, we are going to have to electrify a lot of our lives, uh, perhaps most of our lives, uh, and we really do not appreciate electricity as a form of energy or what the challenges. Oh, was, uh, you know. Uh, or the opportunities it creates. So if people are as obsessed with about electricity, please get in touch. I don't have a book oh. project, but it's my obsession. right? Now. Oh, I can tell you, I'm going to connect you to Cormac, who's on the call, um, who has spent 40 plus years of his life doing electricity. And has uh, that's okay, isn't it, Cormac, if I connect you? I think, yeah. That oh, would... I'd love that, Louise. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I connect. think that would be a, a really good combination, knowing you both a little bit. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you to everybody for for turning up and, and making Book Club what it is. Some brilliant, brilliant questions, as always. I um, really appreciate all of you and um, look forward to seeing you next time. And thank you, of course, in particular to Akshat for taking the time in a barn not a shed <laughs> oh thank you very much i've done a lot of book events but i really particularly enjoyed this one because of how informed this crowd is and how good the questions were so thank you for challenging me really oh, enjoyed it. thank you all lots of love and um look forward to seeing you soon thank you